tips and tricks for painting Nerf blasters and other props, little follow up video from my talk at Foam Fest Live. Hello friends, how you doing? Rainbow here. And if you remember, I did a talk on, you know, painting blasters and other props at Foam Fest Live. The video to this is uh, linked in the description. And I promised that I'd do some follow-up videos because I only had about, what, half an hour, 45 minutes time to talk about a topic that I could talk about for an entire day. So this is the first follow-up video to that. The entire section of, you know, tips and tricks that I've sort of accumulated over the years that I wanted to share with you when you, you know, paint blasters and do all other sorts of things, I uh, had to cut out from the presentation because it was simply too long. So I have three sheets of paper right there uh, with a couple of things. So I'm going to be looking down at this every now and then. And I just want to talk to you about the things. So I put them together. So just general, they're not in any chronological order. They are just sort of, you know, how they came to my mind, basically. All right, let's start. Uh, first off, wet paint smells. So that's a question I get asked a lot. Like, when is it safe to uh, go on and, you know, put your blaster back together or, you know, to continue with the detail work after spray painting and all that. And with spray paint, wet paint, wet spray paint still smells. So the reason for that is the uh, whatever thinner or whatever, whatever chemicals that are in the paint that, you know, help it, allow it to get out of the spray can and onto whatever you're painting needs to evaporate from the paint. And until that process is done, you will still be able to smell it. So if you say if you want to do some weathering or some detail work and you're not sure, you know, just have a quick sniff of, of your project. And if you can still sort of smell the paint, it is not fully dry. So, you know, just leave it there wherever it is. If you paint little parts, like, you know, triggers and like the little nubs and whatnot, I use uh, Blutec to actually attach it to something so they don't fly about and I don't have to hold them. So let's say I wanted to paint this little piece of a hammer shop, which I have to paint from both sides. What I do is I get an old pot from some paint, whatever that was, and I put some Blutec on the top here. And then I would stick this into there, make sure that it holds. And now this will perfectly hold it. So I can hot grab it onto here, I can spray paint on that, and then I'll put it down and it'll just, you know, whatever surface, it'll just rest on like this and it'll be happy to dry on there. And then I'll leave it on there. If I do some weathering, I do it with the thing on and I leave it to dry. And then I, with the clear coat, same thing. And when I'm done, I'll take it off. And so that's a little tip, like get some blue tape on empty paint cans or a piece of cardboard would do for all like the little attachment things that we, if you want to paint those. So yeah, just, you know, stick it to something so it can't fly about. When I paint the first layer of my blaster, it doesn't matter if it's the primer or if it's the first layer of color on the dry primer or if it's the first layer of clear coat on the dry project, I always hold my shell parts. And for that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this. I'm currently working on that. And what I mean is, if I'm doing the first layer and I wanna make sure that all around these edges I have paint on, I'll just hold it like so and then turn it while I do it. And I'm going to make sure that I have a part where I can grab onto, like just here. And if I don't, I'm going to take it, grab it onto the very last, just paint till about here, then set it down so I can paint the rest. Reason for that is just to make sure that with the primer, the first layer of color, and the first layer of clear coat, I'm actually hitting every, each and every corner. And then I have it on my piece of cardboard or whatever where it rests on. And then I have second layer while it's laying down and third layer because I'm mostly paint wet on wet. So you don't want to touch wet paint. I said it in my video, if you paint with acrylics, which I do a lot, use a wet palette. And if you don't know what a wet palette is, go Google it. It's basically a device that keeps your uh, acrylics wet for a longer time. If you don't want to spend money on a wet palette, you can just make one yourself. So this is my wet palette. And what this is, this is like some piece of plastic that actually came with some Warhammer set. And it just has, you know, like this bit right here, which sort of lowered down. And if, if I sit this on the table, it actually angles down that way. So the water will, won't run out this way, it will run down there. And all you need to do is, this is like a couple of layers of just, uh, what's it called, kitchen uh, wipes. And, just uh, a layer of baking paper and that's all it is so it's just this underneath here which stores the water right 
And the baking paper is great because it lets uh, the water through to the color, but it won't allow the color to go down into the wet paper underneath, which is great. So then what I do is I put my colors on here and I can hear when you mix colors and then you get hours to actually work on whatever it is. This is not as good as one as where you have a lid where you can close and actually keep your paint wet for days. It will start to dry eventually, but for me, when I'm sitting down to paint, this, you know, absolutely happily does the trick. If you have a container, like a little Tupperware container in a box that you want to use it at, where you have a lid, fantastic. But this is essentially how you build one. So I talked about drying times and curing times a lot in the talk. If you're not sure what the difference is, drying means the paint is dry so you can touch it and you're not going to leave a mark. Curing means the paint is cured all the way and you're safe to work with it. Just be aware that curing times really depend on the layers of paint that you put on a blast. And I said this in a talk, but I can't stress this enough. If you do the entire thing where you have um, you know, primer is done and is dry, but then you put automotive silver on it and then wet on wet base color and another layer of color. Leave this enough time to dry because it will take longer. Same with clear coats. And yeah, just so you're aware of curing times. This, like, I've messed up many of paint jobs because I thought it was ready, um, but it wasn't. Just go back to the first thing is like wet paint smells. So if you can still smell the fume evaporating from the paints, it's not dry. I use a lot of rub and buff. Uh, or gilding wax. So this is gilding wax, in this case silver, and I get this from mycostumes.de if you're in Europe. And this is phenomenal. This stuff lasts forever. It's essentially, well, it's similar to Robin Buff. It's not the exact same. Uh, it comes in a pot like this, and you can see I've probably painted five projects with this, and I'm still just sort of scratching the surface of what there is. This is going to last forever. They seem expensive because they're like 10, 15 bucks, but they're gonna last forever. The thing about this stuff is it wants a rough surface to, you know, a, to stick to. And it takes a little practice because when you start doing this for the first time, you actually tend to just sort of get too much on either the cloth or your finger or your sponge or whatever you use to apply and just rub it on there and you just smear it all over it. So the key to this is practice with some old parts that you don't necessarily need and also take your time to build up. So if I take this uh, piece again that I've been working on, this up here is done with the gilding silver, uh, the gilding wax, as well as all of this, as well as all of these. Okay, so there's no bright dry brushing in there. The big stuff here is applied with a sponge and all the other stuff around here is just with my finger. And I literally just sort of touch it a little bit, have just a little bit on there, and then just go slide over the edge here to, you know, make that look. And where the heavy part is, you know, just did a bit more, and then a bit less on here. And you can get great effects with this stuff, but you gotta try and learn how to work with it, because otherwise you'll end up with just a big spotch of metal um, wax all over the shop. So, you know, take your time, Get some weird piece that you don't really care about, you know, spray painted black and then just see what you can do. If you want a more cartoonish style of paint job, what you can do is before you start the weathering, wherever there is an edge on your blaster, like, you know, let's say something like this right there, just draw a black line on this side just to sort of, you know, put a higher contrast on the edges because with a lot of cartoon style um, paintings and drawings and whatever, the uh, the edges and the contrast at the edge is really really harsh. So what a lot of my cosplay friends do is if if you know if they want to just highlight that edge even more, even if it's just that much of an edge, just one side to the one that's lower, just paint that black, for like you know a millimeter, or two millimeter, depending on how big the project is. So if you if I, if you do like a big armor piece, you might even do that much of a black line. If you're talking about a little blast, it's only going to be a millimeter or two, but it's the little thing, and you do that before the weathering. And then you weather over that and you treat that as it were just to show that you normally weather it. But just, you know, draw little black lines around the edges to um, increase that contrast even more. One thing I honestly don't do as often as I probably should, you should try out new paints and new paint combinations on old shell pieces that you don't necessarily use. And be aware that these should be the same kind of shells and plastics that you're using in that project. So for instance, if you're going to paint a zero X shot blaster, 
don't dry out the paint on a piece of Nerf plastic because these plastics are not the same. And it'll make sense when you think, okay, Nerf and Zuru. But even with Nerf blasters, paint will react differently to the blue plastic and the red plastic and the yellow plastic and the white plastic of Nerf blasters. And so now, what if you want to do, if you want to paint a modulus and you only have one, uh, try it on the inside of the blaster first. Um, that's, you know, the easiest thing to do. I honestly don't do that much, which results in me having to fix a bunch of my paint jobs while I'm doing it. And a lot of times projects end up looking differently because of that, because I had some other idea in mind and then, you know, something else wanted to happen. So yeah, just if you can, if you're modern, you have a bunch of old cutoffs and plus don't throw them away, keep them in the box. And whenever you have new paints and new, you know, combinations, try that on those and you know it'll make your life a lot easier i don't know i think it was bob ross or someone who said in painting there are no mistakes and you just kind of have to work with what you're doing and what the paint's doing and um i don't know if that's true for all the projects that i've done but many of my nerve projects resulted from me just dealing with the mistake and the mishap that sort of occurred during the paint job so what i mean by this is you just just because things don't work like you planned them doesn't mean the project is ruined. So here's uh, two examples. First one, right there, uh, the white, you know, crystal-like sniper, cosplay sniper rifle Raxa LS37. I wanted to, this to be a full-on white blaster and then sort of, you know, hand paint crystals on it to make it look like it's actually an icicle. That's That was the idea. So I tried to get this white. And if you know the, the Zuru Blaster underneath actually is red. So it kind of looks like that. And yeah, so I was like, okay, it's just going to be easy. It's going to prime this automotive silver, going to put some white on it and then go. And no, it wasn't the case. I couldn't get the white to be white because for some reason, the white just sort of happened to grab bits and bobs of the red of the plastic and pull them up through the primer and the automotive silver and made it so it was slightly yellow, slightly orange. And especially in the recesses where the paint took longer to dry, like in all the nooks and crannies and everything, it just appeared to be red or not even not red, but orange or yellow. So it was no clean white. I, and I've painted on this blaster, I've probably painted six layers of white and I couldn't get it to be crystal white. And obviously I didn't do the whole trying out uh, beforehand, but then what I, okay, what do I do from there? Um, and I went like, okay, I need to do something else. So then I went, I can't get it white. So I'm just going to get, take this ice blue, the light blue here, and I'm going to make it completely ice blue. And then I draw the crystals on in white. And then it's not going to look like the one I want it, but you know, it's going to be something. That was the idea. So I flipped all the pieces upside down so I, so I would see the inside of them to, you know, make sure that I cover all the corners of the piece. So, you know, if that would be the shell, and, you know, just resting them on here and then spray painting it from here just to get all the corners so all the edges and everything would uh, be blue. And then I wanted to flip them over and put the entire spray paint, the entire blaster blue. But then when I flipped them over, I saw like, ooh, that kind of looks cool because like the blue, what happened is when you spray paint from here onto that edge, the blues were kind of missed around this just a little bit, not like all the way and also randomly, but it just kind of sort of, you know, cloud around this and cover a little bit of this blue as well. And that is what happened. And I'm like, wow, that was a paint effect that I didn't even know existed. And as you can see, I was so happy with this, so I just left it. I, in all honesty, I went with all the other parts. It's like, just the corners, you know, just just the corners and just the edges and all that. Um, just, just the surroundings. Flipped them over and like, done. I'm not going to do anything else with it. And that's how this paint job came to be. And essentially, it was the mistake of not trying out the paint beforehand. And it was then the mishap of the white not be an actual white that led to me using the blue and then it was the color sort of creeping around the edges and corners which I didn't account for creating this paint job and in the end I was really happy with it so that's one example the other one is the zombie slayer hammer shot and the slingfire right here 
but let's talk about just one of those, but basically these two. The original plan was to have silver and the green metallic as shiny as possible. So when you look at this, before I started weathering, like there, uh, it was really shiny, and I wanted to keep it this way. But then I put down the masking tape, and I spray painted other metallic layers over the top, so to build up, you know, go from the green to the silver to the graphite. And I left it in the sun. And so two things happen here. Number one is the metallic spray paint, the chemicals in the paint reacted with the tape because I put it on too thick on the tape. And also being in the sun, in the straight sun, it got really warm and accelerated that process from to happen. So when I pulled off the tape, a lot of the glue from the tape actually stuck to the blaster and ruined the shininess of the entire thing. So I was really bummed about this and to a point where I was like, I'm just gonna repaint the entire thing. But then I went, okay, no, just give it, you know, put on some rust. I never intended for this to be rusty at all. I never intended to this for to be, to be weathered like that. But then I painted on some rust on the spots where there was a lot of glue. And I just painted on the rust and I used the structure of the glue to make it look like the rust actually has three dimensional structure. And then I weathered the shit out of this blaster to the result, which is right there which a lot of you guys actually love, and I now love too, and it turned out fantastic. But again, it came from a mistake. So the one mistake was being, you know, just putting on too much tape and sort of pressing it on everywhere and then spraying too much paint on top of it without trying it out beforehand. And mistake number two is leaving it in the sun to dry where it got too hot. And so, you know, the glue separated from the tape. But again, it's just how you deal with that. So, in essence, you know, you can always salvage whatever project to some extent. So, don't be discouraged if something doesn't go to plan and you end up with something different. You know, it might still turn out awesome and a lot better than you'd ever imagine it. There is a whole debate about painting moving parts. I, for instance, like to paint moving parts. And I've got a trigger right here. The trigger that I'm currently working on. And there is people that say, I uh, do not paint triggers and moving parts because it'll rub off anyways and it'll just look stupid. Or, you know, it'll be in the way and interfere with the smoothness of the trigger. And these things are true to some extent. So in this case, the, this part down here will be inside the shell so you won't see it. So if that rubs off, I don't care. This part in here, up there, will be inside the shell so you don't know. You will only see like the last little bit of here. And if I want to make sure that this doesn't get scratched, what you want to do is you take the inside of the handguard where, see if I can do this, right there, where this trigger will then move. You take this part and then that side here, you just sand down a little bit more. And you're not going to notice it later, but if you give this a little bit more of a sand, there's not enough plastic to actually uh, rub off the paint on this side. So that's one thing you can do. And the other thing, so if you know that you're painting moving parts, just make more space. So if you look at this rough cut, which is one of my first ever paint jobs, um, you can see here that it starts to rub off, but I've been using this one a lot. And all I've done is, I've sanded this down a little bit more, as well as the inside of the grip here, so I have more space. I'll still be sort of, this plastic will still sort of eventually rub off that, but it's gonna take a while. And as for triggers, a lot of people go with strife triggers and stuff. You can easily, in my opinion, paint strife triggers. The rift trigger is a bit more of a problem because it sits in the grip a lot tighter as the trigger itself, but same deal. Um, this one has seen a lot and it's still fine. So. That what you see here is actually dirt. It's not rubbed off, which brings me to my next point. If you're, you know, worried about the painted trigger will not go as smooth as an unpainted trigger, why don't you just, when you have clear coated it all and it's all dry and you put it back in the blaster, just, you know, lubricate it somehow. So what I've done to this, which is actually the dirt that you see right there, right here, <laughs> um, what I've done to this is I just put some uh, lithium grease on 
all the moving parts, especially the ones that I paint. And this trigger is as smooth as it can be. And if you're looking for a very, very clean looking, you know, no weather, no use look blaster, you would definitely want to use um, a, a transparent sort of grease so you don't see it. But if you're going for a used look anyways, um, yeah, like a post-apocalyptic blaster and stuff, this is great because this will just add to, you know, the look of the blaster by, of course, you would have a trigger unit um, lubed up at some point, so it's nice and smooth, and that will build up, and that will sort of, there will be residue spots and all that. So you can, in my opinion, definitely paint moving parts, just as long as you know that you're painting a moving part and you kind of prepare. So for, yeah, that's just my opinion on painting moving parts. I think you can and you should do it because it just looks amazing. As we're talking about painting moving parts, um, this translates right into the next sort of tip. If you're building your blaster, if you're building your integration and whatever, and you're getting ready for the paint shop, before you start painting, think about the general idea of where you, what you want to do with the paint. As I said earlier, paint jobs can vary in process, but the idea should be clear. And what I mean by that is, if you have areas where you know that you're going to be painting at least seven or eight, nine layers, so primer, uh, automotive silver, base color, top color, details, weather ring, and clear coat, clear coat, clear coat. And you know that these parts are somewhere where there's other parts that need to move alongside it. Just think of the thickness that you will add with the paint, especially with metallic paints, because of the metallic particles, they add more uh, layer to the blaster itself. And if you have spots where it's really tight and where there's plastic moving on plastic, just, you know, take some sandpaper and take away a little bit of these walls so they're moving like that. So when the paint's on there, they can, be, they, you know, they won't interfere. Because if pieces are already moving like this and you put the paint on, that will get sticky. That will, you know, get tricky to move. So that's something you can also anticipate when you think about your paint job and what you want to do. And... Most of the cases, I sort of know what I want to do with my paint jobs, and then I know where I can put down some paint. One very big thing that uh, I constantly miss to do, um, and where I end up, you know, with a lot of additional work, is internal screw posts and all of these sort of things. Especially when you do multiple layers of paints and spray paints and all that. There's two options that you have. Either you cover all the internal screw posts, or you sand them down before or after. And what I mean is, again, taking this shell bit, let's, you know, take this part because, you know, it illustrates the point quite nicely. This one right here uh, will go through both parts of the front shell and is a screw post, you know, to screw in the other shell. And that's actually also a moving part because, you know, this blaster just sort of flips down like that. Uh, what you want with these, now that they are painted, they will get stuck. Um, a lot easier and all of these actually like that one and that one and you know the ones over here because they have so much paint on it when you put them together they'll stick together a lot more it'll make it harder to pull the blaster apart afterwards so to avoid this I could have either taped it off which depending on the size of the blaster is actually a lot of work because it's not just screw posts it's also you know these things where um, the shells sort of, you know, modulus blasters have this a lot where just pieces of shell just sort of slide together and hold it. Or Raven uh, has that as well. Like all these things want to be covered because if you cover those with paint, yeah, they're already meant to friction fit. And if you put another layer on both sides, it's just going to be too tight and it's going to lock up the blaster. So there's two options. You either cover those with tape or what I mostly do, um, get a little knife or like a, you know, little... A file a little bit of sanding paper and before you assemble your blaster just sit somewhere outside with a mask and just sort of you know just rub around them so till you see the original color plastic and then you're good to go and especially like the, these cause problems especially if the paint's not entirely dry so if you put a blaster together that has lots of paint on the screw posts and on all the connecting uh, posts and the paint is not a hundred percent cured it'll just glue together because they're meant to friction fit and it'll just sit there and you're not going to get it apart. 
So be aware with the screw posts and internal sort of posts that hold shells together. They are friction fit and if you add layers of paint it's going to add to that friction a lot. Even like one or two layers of paint can make your life miserable. So be aware of that. If you look into paint metallics you might and you want to have them shiny like chrome or gold or copper or all these kind of things and you want to have them really shiny. You've got to be aware of clear coat and um, metallics colors and how they interact and I've mentioned this briefly in my video that most of the normal 1k metallic spray paints and the 1k clear coats if you spray the clear coat on top of the metallic it dulls it down and just you know it, it, the metallic is going to lose its shine and all that so be aware of that and at this point if you really set on like a golden blaster like the zero ones or they want to recreate something like this or like a really chrome looking blaster it might be worth thinking about switching to 2K paints. And so there's a difference between a 1K and a 2K paint. 1K is the standard for most of us because we don't really think about it, you know, that there's a 2K paint sort of thing. You just grab a spray can and you just try it out. And that's all good and all fine. But for metallics, the 2K is probably better because the 2K, when applied correctly, doesn't need a clear coat on top of it. So that means if you get some 2K chrome color, you can apply that chrome color to everything. And if you apply this correctly, you don't need a clear coat and therefore you don't have the risk of the clear coat ruining the metallic effect underneath. So why don't you just always use 2K paints instead of 1K if they're clearly better? Um, both sides have advantages and disadvantages. So the big advantage of a 1K paint, it has a faster curing time on whatever wherever it is uh, and it can be stored after you've opened it the problem with the 2k paint is because normally like sometimes you know you have a can and it'll have a release on the bottom that will release the activator into the can and then you have about let's say i don't know eight to twelve hours max to work with it and then it'll just be you can't use it anymore yeah because the, the paint the two chemicals react with each other and you can't use it so if you only have that little to apply your chrome to and you know using a 2k can you, you go i don't know probably going to use 10 percent and you have to throw away 90 percent because if you're not going to paint anything else so you can't store 2k paint spray paints really which is why i mostly use 1k paints because yeah of that the other thing is the 2k paint because it has the two components that you know work together is a lot more durable so um if you know the blaster, you probably can use it for a LARP or something, or it's gonna, you know, have a rough life and it's gonna be thrown around. 2K paint is probably the way to go, because it's a lot more durable. But then again, you know, um, it comes with the disadvantage that you can't store it, and that it has longer curing times. But you might not need a clear coat. So, in terms of money. On both sides, there is expensive and less expensive ones. I generally find that 2K paints are more expensive than 1K paints. But in the end, it depends on what you want to do. So I would go with 1K paints unless I really want something really shiny, chrome looking or metallic looking, and then go with that to have uh, the metallic effect. All right, everybody, this was a bunch of tips and tricks, just general overall sort of things. And I hope this was helpful for you. This was a follow-up video on my talk at Foam Face Life. If you haven't seen that talk and that presentation and you want to see it, it's on the YouTube channel, just linked in the description. I hope this video was helpful for you and educational and you did learn something. If you have any things you want to add, you know, feel free to leave um, stuff in the comments. Um, I'll make sure they're going to read it. If you have any questions, if you want to know anything more specifically, if you have any other questions about painting, please, you know, don't hesitate to ask. As always, nothing that I say here is the whole truth. Um, you know, I'm, it's always a learning process, and I hope that you guys can learn from the stuff that I did. Yeah, so now off you go and have fun painting your blasters. I hope you can work with a lot of the things. And, yeah, it's just go out and play with the colors. And, you know, painting is a joy, and it's, it's, it's something, you know, that adds so much life to a blaster. So... Please make sure to check out my website, like, make sure to check out the other videos linked on screen now. Check out the social media, my Patreon and all that if you want to know more. You know the drill, leave a like and a sub and all that. And I'll see you next time. Love and sunshine.